Hello and welcome to The Progress Theory, where we discuss how to implement scientific principles for optimising human performance. I am Dr Phil Price and on today's episode we're joined by SNC coach and performance nutritionist at Omnia Performance, Johnny Payne. Now training as a generalist or hybrid training has become really popular in recent years. People just don't want to train for one sport now, they want to be good at multiple sports or for example they want to be really strong but at the same time, they want to be able to run a marathon. Johnny has been training athletes that specialize in multiple disciplines for over 15 years now, and he's since set up Omnia Performance, which specializes in concurrent training for the development of strength and endurance. In this episode, Johnny and I discuss the true meaning of hybrid training, how strength and endurance can actually coexist, and how we can structure our week to ensure peak performance as well as maximum recovery. As always, follow The Progress Theory on Instagram and YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please check out all of our other content. Here is Johnny Payne. Hey Johnny, how are you doing? Good, my friend. How are you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Thank you so much for coming on the Progress Theory. Uh, I've been watching your Instagram for quite some while, and I'm a big fan of the stuff that you're doing, uh, your coaching, and the stuff that Fergus Crawley is doing as well. You've got a bit of a uh, really good ethos down there, and it links in with the, I think, hybrid training or the ability to develop strength and endurance at the same time is something that's got really popular and then just blew up over over lockdown. Um, so it'll be great to hear about your yeah. insights the challenges you're doing the the projects you're doing and also like some of your coaching and programming philosophies anything like me anything like you you lead and i'll follow now nah, sounds good and the fact that when i when i every time i look at your um instagram i see that you like your skateboarding and i was like we're gonna get on so i was like definitely i've got to get you on the progress theory <laughs> yeah yeah I, I spotted the vans t-shirt there when we, when we, yeah, when yeah. we joined uh, uh, online there a minute ago dressing yeah, appropriately stuff. <laughs> so do you want to give a little bit, a bit of a background to yourself and maybe a bit of background to the omnia performance yeah uh it's a funny question isn't it we, we, i was on a podcast with fergus the other, the other week and we actually need to re-record that and he said tell us who johnny Payne is and and i i stumbled because i thought oh how do you do that yeah. it's an interesting one isn't it but uh I'm from the very north of Scotland, uh, from a, a place called Thurso, um, which is the most northern town in, in, in Britain. Um, not a lot there, apart from uh, skateboarding and surfing, which is uh, where that all comes from. Um, and uh, moved down to, to Glasgow. Various different jobs and, and various different uh, versions of myself from Glasgow through down into, into Nottingham. And down in Nottingham, uh, I got into, through various means, um, some of them nefarious we got got into uh, mixed martial arts which back then wasn't even mixed martial arts it was uh, no holds barred or or, or, you know it was very much underground stuff not illegal just people didn't know what it was so uh, so i did that for a long time i kind of cut my teeth there as that uh, sport exploded and evolved um younger fresher and more stylistically capable men came along (laughs) that's uh, that's my my way of saying that i wasn't very good at it and uh, I kind of found myself in a position where I was offering um, really just um, uh, as, as a kind of a friendship thing, offering a bit of coaching advice. I understood strength and conditioning quite well and uh, nutrition certainly. And I was able to help guys prepare for fights. And that became something I became very passionate about. And, uh, you know, long story short, here we are roughly 18 years later as a coach. I've looked after boxers, uh, mixed martial artists, jiu-jitsu players. And then over the past I think eight or nine years uh, moved into this kind of hybrid world where we're looking after uh, uh, people who who, got, who have goals and performance goals uh, at both ends of this kind of strength and endurance spectrum. So, eighteen years in the game now. Uh, I, I've, I've said that a few times recently. On the bio, it says fifteen, and then I realised we wrote the bio about three years ago. So now I'm having to, having to adjust that that uh, timeline. But uh, yeah, strength and conditioning coach uh, and a performance nutritionist and um, and really very much enjoy enjoy what I do and enjoy the uh, experiences I'm very, very privileged to have through that. Are you doing a PhD in nutrition? Yeah, yeah, well, it's on hold. Uh, through, through the Masters, uh, we had um, the opportunity to kind of to, to, to look at uh, 
what's essentially nutritional periodization um, and see if we couldn't push the boundaries there. And usually a lot of what I did uh, from, a, from an academic perspective came from trying to hone fighters' uh, ability of making weight uh, and or getting into a position where they were fighting uh, safely. One of those kind of elements happens to be nutritional periodization. So what tends to happen is that carbohydrates are cut uh, and many people that would listen would understand that process that you're going to cut the carbohydrates in order to lose the weight in, in the week or, or, or two leading up to the fight. But what that leaves is, is a very depleted fighter. And then what you have on fight night is this hopeful kind of return to form and then, then, then a, mm. you know, a performance, which is dangerous. So we're looking at whether or not we need to cut the, the carbohydrates right back or whether we can cut it back to the point where this... Uh, uh, enzyme response uh, is triggered and, and whether there's any way that we can kind of trigger it on and off within a, a kind of a dose dependent um, format. That's that's a really rough way of saying what we're trying to do. But then COVID's kind of put, COVID and life actually, I, I, I can blame it on COVID, but actually there was other things kind of mm. taking over. That sounds really interesting. Back burner. Mm. But still interesting to me. Going back to the to the bio there, uh, I always forget, and I think maybe my wife will listen back. I should start these things with I am a I am a husband and father of four. Is, uh, <laughs> that's where I should start the bio, and then then talk about the other things. That's the, that's the priority flip. So. Get the essentials in, and then go into details. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Only because I can hear footsteps in the background. And <laughs> no, it's wicked. So, how did you um, develop Omnia Performance? Uh, could it did did Fergus go to university? at in Nottingham and did you meet there and then it's developed this uh sort of coaching relationship between the two where you've developed it into a, a business N not quite no um so I Nottingham's where I kind of cut my teeth but I actually moved back to Scotland so I'm, I'm based just outside Edinburgh moved back to Scotland um oh, best part of 12 years ago when our, when our first daughter was born so she, she'll be 13 soon in fact so we moved back months after that uh, so I've been back in Scotland for, for over a decade um, Fergus came to me uh, for, for coaching uh, roughly four years ago. Uh, actually, an interesting insight into this kind of hybrid methodology that I've been coaching already for sort of the previous four or five years with, uh, alongside Alex Viada at Complete Human Performance. Um, Fergus had a, a, a campaign idea where he, he was looking to squat uh, as much accumulated weight over 24 hours as he could in order to to beat uh, the, the, the then standing world record. Uh, and so ultimately he was going to be squatting X amount of weight over and over for 24 hours. Uh, he was a powerlifter, rugby player. Anybody who follows Fergus knows that background. And no real endurance uh, training there. He, he certainly had an engine, but, but uh, very much based on this kind of... Mm. Um, anaerobic kind of sprint style, you know, things that you would expect from, from powerlifters. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, he, he just didn't entertain aerobic uh, activity much. When he came to me, it's because he understood that, that I was kind of working in that hybrid environment, but um, it was very clear to me from the very start, as soon as he put that idea across, that we were actually looking at what amounted to an, an ultra-endurance event, you know, squatting. It may be biomechanically mm -hmm. squatting, but for 24 hours, anything repeated for 24 hours is, is ultra-endurance. So, so we worked on that. Uh, we, we came through that, and uh, it went it went well. But actually, he ended up injured through that, and that was one of those kind of. There was nothing we could. You know, we mitigated against it as much as we could, but it was always a risk. Not not dissimilar to nervous and things. It's 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 always going to be a risk uh, to to do something quite so challenging. Uh, unfortunately, his knee went, and so we we cut it. I, I might be wrong, but I think about something like fourteen, fifteen hours in, maybe a little bit further. So he'd, he'd already done a considerable amount of work by then. Uh, and then we've just maintained that kind of uh, coach-athlete relationship. And over those years, Fergus is a really bright guy. Fergus actually did uh, theology at university, so not a related subject, but um, certainly has that academic underpinning. And, uh, you know, always asking questions, always very involved, always uh, autodidactically, if you like, kind of off there studying and trying to learn a bit more for his own sake. And uh, slowly we formed this kind of, over time, it became obvious that although I'm guiding the coaching, he knew a lot about what was happening and could then, rather than say, right, what do I do next, coach? He was saying, how about we try this and how about we do this? So it became more of a, what should, what should we have, a collaborative relationship. Uh, and, and I saw a great deal of potential in him. He, he picks up uh, clients very easily because of his, his status, um, but he didn't want to half-arse that and, and really wanted to make sure that he was doing the right job. So we've just worked together 
and now he's he's just as uh, capable of coach as, as any coach I've met. So he's developed that relationship with me and through me, but, but very much now a standalone coach in his own right. So because we've been doing that together for so long, uh, setting up, and I, I had uh, I worked at CHP, still work for CHP uh, with Alex, uh, but I also had Painless Performance, which was my own company. Uh, and uh, we decided to, to sort of band together, start Omnia Performance. Uh, so, so Painless okay. Performance is no more Omnia Performance is Fergus and I together. And essentially we are kind of owning, if you like, as much as we can, mm. the, the little niche that we've carved out from ourselves, yeah. experientially as well as uh, perhaps academically. What's working with Alex Fiada like? Because he's uh, another person that would be great to have on, on the podcast. Um, very knowledgeable guy um, in a similar area. Like, what, what's he like? Uh, if he's watching it, wonderful. If, if he doesn't watch this <laughs> podcast, he's a, he's a terrible human. Only joking. Uh, Alex is great. Alex is great. I've learned a lot from Alex. As you would expect, if you know anything about Alex, is um, uh, unrivaled, in my opinion, his scientific knowledge and his, his, his scientific recall, you know. You can ask him a question about sort of the the, the, the most granulized minutia in, in terms of you know physiology, bio, anything really, uh, and, and he'll have a sharp and concise and intelligent answer right immediately for you, which I find startling in actual fact. Um, so what you see if you've ever followed Alex, where he does his Q and A's on Instagram, where he's sitting on his bike doing his list, answering all these questions, and it looks like how could he how could he know that straight away? He does. He's just a sharp guy. Uh, he and I crossed paths. Um, I, I had developed my own kind of hybrid methodology, if you like, and was doing this kind of stuff with, with my own clients and, as I say, carving out my own niche, my own kind of specialty, if you like, and experientially with my own uh, quote-unquote athletic background, um, you know, trying things and failing, trying things and failing, and almost in, in parallel with that, Alex was doing the same, and, and he, he's... Mm. His scientific knowledge is extraordinary. So he wrote, the hybrid athlete wrote the book. Uh, off the back of that, I sought him out for, for a little bit of coaching for uh, my attempt at oh, home, cool. my um, completion yeah. of the Kelpman, uh, which, which Fergus has just done as well. Alex worked with me through that uh, and, and we got to know each other very well, obviously. Similar conversations to the ones that Fergus and I had laterally and uh, he asked me to come on and be a coach. And uh, I've been a coach uh, alongside Alex now. Oh, it's probably gone on six years, I think. So, yeah, that's a long stand. And Alex and I are now very good friends um, and, and have been for quite some time. So, yeah, I've, I'm very, very lucky to have such people around me, in fact. So, yeah, I can't speak highly enough of, of Alex and what he does. Yeah. It seems like he, I don't want to say the godfather of hybrid training, but because it's been around for a long time. But when he wrote his book, that's when it became slightly more mainstream and it's kind of gathered more popularity as it's gone over the last few yeah. years but it this lockdown seems to have really exploded and yourself and fergus might have been ones that have really exploded it in the uk so that probably on top of crossfit functional fitness there's a lot of different things that are really starting to blow up i think people are starting to see it as like opportunities where they've got like sport and then there's you know taking part in exercise but now there's an, a competitive element to everything uh, and i think it's drawing people in there's some really interesting things going on in that in that kind of space. Um, Alex is responsible for the term hybrid athlete, you know, and that, that's he wrote the book off the back of it. And now, now it's uh, you know people who who aren't even aware of complete performance or Alex are talking about being a hybrid athlete, which I find very interesting because the source, if you like, I mean, is Alex the source? No, yeah. and he'd be the first to to suggest that that would be kind of silly, really. I mean, hybrid hybrid athletes. Alex and I have always joked, really what we're looking at is people, so, so for anybody who doesn't really know what that term means, what we're kind of looking at is, is the, the opportunity to program for and continue prog continually progress in to maybe even more seemingly disparate uh, sporting outcomes. So, for example, a powerlifter uh, and an, an endurance runner, so let, let's say an ultramarathon runner. Up until a certain point, it seemed, you know, a powerlifter or a bodybuilder would never look at anything that, that would possibly, cardio kills my gains and all that kind of stuff. And, and what we were really saying was, well, only if you have 100% of a, uh, you know, a powerlifting program, you try and splice 100% of a of a, an ultra-endurance program together, you smash them together, you get 200% of a program, you cannot recover, so people get injured 
Uh, and then some of the science was a bit iffy. The interference effect uh, exists, but only sort of for a slight finite amount of time, and then things kind of reset. And so yes, there is an interference, but it's very very finite. And ultimately, over the over and above that, are, are progressive uh, uh, potentials. So what we what we're looking at really, and this is the kind of joke that we shared over a few mm. years, is all we're talking about is fitness. You know, this used to be called being fit. You know being able to kind of move a, a more than average load or, or without uh, casting sort of detrimental slurs out there, just not being weak, you know, in, in that strength end of that spectrum, but also, you know, not being gassed when, when they run for the bus, you know. I've looked after powerlifters before who, who I knew uh, couldn't uh, and, and legitimately couldn't have run the 500 metres they needed to, to catch the bus that might be pulling away. You know, they see the indicator go on and you would hope to go, oh, right, I'll speed up and I'll catch, a, catch my lift. But these guys couldn't have done it. They couldn't have done a 100 metre sprint without needing to lie down for a half hour. And that's actually where I kind of started looking at things going, that's, that can't be right, you know. Surely being a power lifter and having a, an aerobic underpinning would, would add to your volume potential. You know, that, that just seems sensible to me. But it didn't to the powerlifting community, and it didn't. The flip side of that, obviously, we're picking on powerlifters. The flip side of that would be this um, uh, aerobic based community, endurance athletes who were afraid of lifting weights in case it made them, even in the boxing world, afraid of weight, lifting weights in case, it, in case it made them bulky and slow and detracted from the ability to be an endurance athlete. Whereas the reality is a stronger, more physically robust, more. Uh, uh, you know, better postural control, better proprioception, et cetera, et cetera, that comes from strength training, lends itself perfectly to a better, more efficient endurance athlete. And it just seemed like, you know, there was a, there was a gap in the middle that, that everybody was, oh, we better not go through there. And, and Alex and myself and a few others were saying, well, that, that seems counterintuitive, in fact. Although you're saying it's counterintuitive to do it, we're saying it's counterintuitive not to. And really... That's my that's my definition of being fit is being able to be capable of all things. You know, and you look at uh, I have a, 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 sh- a short, uh, very unsatisfactory military background, but I do look after a lot of military uh, uh, aspirants as well. And you look at those guys, and they have to be capable of all these things. So you've got uh, an obligate hybrid athlete there, or even if you look at anybody who, who follows sport from a strength and conditioning perspective. Or even, even somebody with a good analytical mind would look at rugby and say, well, these guys are powerful, but it's sprint work. But if you look at a rugby, uh, you look at the, um, you know, if you put a GPS in one of these guys, you'll find that over the 80 minutes of a game, 70, 60, 70 minutes of that is aerobic movement. You know, they're just positioning one, one position, getting themselves ready for the next piece, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to be aerobically capable. And if they're not, they're not very good rugby players and not effective. So what you've got is an obligate hybrid athlete, you know, or somebody who's fit. So that's, yeah, it's been interesting, as you say, to see this kind of explosion of it, because it feels like the reality is that the, the science has always been there, the, um, the logic has always been there, and, and, and the proof has always been there. Yet there was this kind of period of time where people felt like uh, those things, you sort of never the twain shall meet, when in actual fact, you know, that doesn't even make any sense. And I think... It's almost like a, a timing thing. The lockdown has allowed people to stop and think about it. And maybe there's the, the, the popularity of, of what Alex has done, some of what Fergus and I have been doing, etc., has piqued people's interests. And then it's like anything. It just then it snowballs and people go, well, of course. And you, then you have a lot of people in the same space, and it's, which is great, you know, because people are then, I'm rambling a bit here, apologies, but people then allow themselves the opportunity to do more than just that one thing which is another big part of what we're trying to say is don't don't box yourself in you know you might you might enjoy doing a, a 5k even though you're a power lifter it might be a great day out or you know have you ever tried doing a, a sprint triathlon despite the fact that you're a, an olympic weightlifter might be good might actually help you you know so hopefully we're just helping people have fun at the end of the day and kind of ex- excuse me explore their own potential somewhat yeah well, it sounds like people are even if people are like thinking that oh you know these are two qualities they can't really develop together ultimately concurrent training has been around for you know many years you know if you've got a rugby player they're going to have some kind of uh 
training which is developing qualities that may not be fully linked to what they're doing but at the same time it's providing a base and it's the same with a triathlete they're going to be doing some form of strength training which is going to hopefully improve the physical qualities to help with their sport even if it's not seen as aerobic so despite people thinking that the two don't really mix we've been doing it for a long period of, of time and i think what's cool about what you yourself fergus and alex have really done is that you've now popularize the fact that you can actually push in both so for example a triathlete would do strength training to improve the triathlete performance but they wouldn't necessarily think oh well, i'm going to try and lift heavy to try and prove that domain but now what you guys are doing so and actually with appropriate programming we can still push on both domains um effectively I'm sure there's going to be times where you push for one, slightly pull back while you push for the other. But ultimately, the aim is that you increase linearly over the, what, you know, if the people are training for being fit and healthy, that should be for multiple years. I, so, I so, yeah. 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 So you'd like to think that as long as you can, you structure everything well, you should be able to improve both domains uh, effectively over time. Yeah, and you've encapsulated that perfectly. In fact, maybe come back and record some of that as a little soundbite for, for Omnia, mate. It's, it's, uh, it, it perfectly describes how, how we see it certainly, and, and and how we how we would like to present it as well. Is that kind of uh, that ability, as you say, to to maybe uh, move between those as, as a kind of you know like a, like an old school graphic guys. Okay, we want to turn the endurance up for a little bit now, so that means this can maintain, or let's just drop that down and play with the strength a little bit. But ultimately, over time, both are still rising. And uh, I think, yeah, appropriate programming, managing the athlete a little bit, which is just about listening to people. You know, it's not um, mm. it's not rocket science, frankly. Uh, and um, just just sort of being careful with it all. Uh, and as you say, concurrent training is not new. It's not like uh, Alex invented concurrent mm. training, nor did we. Um, you know, it, it, arguably, it's a, since the dawn of time kind of thing. You know, you would... Uh, you you would move a big rock and then maybe you have to climb to the top of a mountain to find the to find your cattle or whatever you were doing. You know, we're built for these things, you know. So uh, yeah, we're just we're just trying to kind of allow people that opportunity. And through us, we hope that you know, certainly my own uh, 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 belief in it is that you're just providing people with the opportunity to try things, to do things, to to not pigeonhole themselves, to 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 be capable of doing it uh, without kind of burning themselves out. And, and we're we're just hoping to facilitate that. To, and kind of help um, you know, you know, help guide that a little bit, as opposed to claiming the invention of anything. Or, uh, certainly, the methodology is relatively unique, uh, and the way things that we man- the way that we manage things is relatively unique in the space that we're operating in. But uh, again, none of it's a secret, and none of it's none of it's new. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? We're just looking to kind of harness and manipulate what we do a little bit better each time we kind of explore the science. And I guess that's what science is, isn't it? But um, yeah, I, I, I always find it funny because when you look at it as from a, we've got a company. Obviously, we, we want people to come to us. We we, we want to, to you know continue to make a living out of this and, and and whatnot. But I always find it kind of awkward to do any. I, I know you're not asking me to to do any kind of sales pitch on that front, but you kind of think, well, you know, we're not seeing anything. I, I don't believe we're seeing anything dramatically new. We're just we've we've captured a, a, an appropriate way to manage it, uh, and and that's kind of what we're offering. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been interesting to see it unfold for others too. I'd love to learn a bit more about how you manipulate factors such as volume and intensity, but it would be quite cool to know a little bit more about that and how you've actually put it into practice. So, for example, um, what training challenges have you recently trained for? I know you, there's Project Vertical, uh, like you said yourself and Fergus have done the, the Keltman. Um, how did you... Um, program for those intense events again for, for each individual it's going to be different isn't it you know and, and ultimately something like the Kelman, we've just kind of touched on it a little bit uh, for anybody who doesn't know what the Kelman is the Kelman is a, an extreme uh, triathlon and, and by that it simply means that it looks uh, intense all three elements the swim bike run are just a little bit more extreme you know the, there's a swim in the Kelman is uh, is through it, oh, it is intense. It's, it's a hard event for sure. The swim's 3.4k, I think, through uh, a, a jellyfish infested, very, very cold lock up in the north of Scotland. And then the the, the cycle itself is the, the gradient is just off the scale, just up and down the mountains. And it's, it's longer than the usual Ironman distance. Uh, and then the 
the run in that particular event is is over two Munros, so it runs you it's still forty k, just just over in fact. Uh, but you're climbing two mountains to get so it's ra- rather than just just a marathon, it's, it's it's a marathon over a couple of mountains. So it's a pretty grueling event and certainly takes a, a lot out of the competitive. But an event like that, uh, I mean, you're going to program for that the same as you program for any other triathlon. You just have to look at the gradient. You have to consider the, the uh, you know, like any, anything in strength and conditioning, you consider the needs of that particular event and then reverse engineer how, how you need your athlete to perform. So we're getting more efficient at uh, running. We're, we're getting more efficient at running in, uh, you know, up and down mountains. So we have to we have to practice for that. We have to make sure we're bio- biomechanically strong for it, et cetera, et cetera. Same on the bike, same on the swim. So, no different in essence than any other triathlon. What what makes it different for somebody like Fergus is that he doesn't want to just train triathlon. He doesn't want to say, right, we're gonna we're gonna just completely ignore all but the baseline strength stuff where we do this. He also wanted to continue to maintain, if not as you said earlier on, if not progressive strength through that kind of um, through that kind of campaign, and that, that's tricky. Um, but it, ultimately, it comes down to a, a few very key things, which again aren't aren't um, off the scale crazy or anything. It's just simply about managing volume, uh, and to do that, we have to monitor uh, the the uh, the metrics that that, that that somebody like Fergus is producing. And we have to kind of find that. I'm not a big fan of the, the this sort mm. of uh, uh, MVP with a maximum volume. But, capacity however that's put because i think that that changes over time and i think it depends on the stresses and depends on on the the external stresses as well you know you know things like uh, work-life balance can impact how much volume you, you can you can uh, mm. contain and maintain but it, you can hear me waffling a little bit because it's a little bit of a it depends program uh, it, it depends answer rather um but ultimately the way that we manage the stresses over the course of a week, if you if we consider concurrent training not to really follow a periodized process, which it doesn't, you know, you're, you're looking to a periodization. You're taking part of these different components and concentrating on a certain element for a certain amount of time, and hoping that maintains whilst you then move to maybe a power phase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. With concur- concurrent training, we're, we're trying to progress everything all at once, all the time. So, the way that we manage that is that we consider things on this kind of recurring micro cycle. So let's call it a Monday to Sunday. Um, and what we try and do is, uh, uh, I can't think of who it was that coined this phrase. It wasn't Alex or myself, but, but a consolidation of stressors. Um, so we're consolidating those stressors across this micro cycle. So we have maybe, if we consider high intensity, uh, uh, sort of uh, fast twitch stress, uh, at one end of the scale and low intensity, you know, high volume at the other end of the scale. Um, and, and consider that to be on a sliding scale at each end. So your intensity is coming down and your volume is coming up. What we, that, that's how we program. So we look at the beginning of a week. Um, so triathlon is a good example of this, but we look at the beginning of the week as being, we would match something like a, a heavy squat, which is obviously going to work for our maximal force production and, and, and strength. Uh, and back to back with that, we would do something like um, either high skill or or high intensity uh, sprint, something like that. So it might be skill work, it might be sprint work, but it's something that, that, that has an intense response, if you like. Through the week, we would kind of manipulate that uh, intensity and volume uh, by bringing the intensity down a little bit. So midweek, we're maybe looking at kind of sub-threshold work where we're trying to kind of look at sort of buffering the lactic acid a little bit and, and push that you know, push that boundary up a little bit and allow the body's more efficiency in, in uh, kind of turning over those substrates and metabolites, etc. So that so through the week we're looking at um, maybe threshold work. And again, beginning of the week we could have lower body and lower body sprints. Then on day two maybe upper body and that would be the bike sprints, etc. So we've kept intensity. Sorry, the, the swim sprints. So we've kept intensity high here. Midweek we're looking at maybe this kind of threshold work and we we, we want to retain those modalities as well. And then towards the end of the week, we're going to look at uh, low intensity, steady state. So the longer, slower stuff, this more aerobic base zone two work. And the resistance work towards the end of the week kind of matches that same process. So we'd be looking more at the accessory work, uh, something in the range of 50, 60% of your one rep max and higher reps. So as the week goes on, going back to that sort of crossover model, the intensity has dropped, but the volume's Mm -hmm. picked up. 
what that does is it keeps the recovery from each stress away from each other, if you like, if that makes any sense, right? We're actually kind of keeping the volume away from the intensity. And, and also you get this kind of crossover effect of, of how high volume work, low intensity, actually works very, very well as a recovery uh, protocol for high intensity work and vice versa. So one of the first things that we do for, for somebody like Fergus after he's done maybe an ultra marathon or something or, or, or myself is we won't just sort of say take a week off. We'll get somebody back in the gym two, three days later and have them do heavy squats, full range of motion, uh, three rep max, something like that, not to, not to max, um, but something that allows that full range of motion, allows the muscles to contract, et cetera, et cetera, and pumps the blood through. The other end of that scale is if somebody's done a powerlifting competition, great thing to do afterwards would be get them on the bike and just do some zone two work and have these kind of things work through the system. So again, it's one of those it depends things, but that's that's the kind of that's the model that we're looking at. This kind of high intensity dropping to to a high volume over the course of the week, and that's that consolidation, that management of stressors is the um, that's the way the programs put together. And then over and above that, we're obviously looking at metrics. We're looking at the response to these things. We we, we use RPE a lot, um, but we also track very specific data. So uh, heart rate data is very key to us. So if Fergus is Zone two is like seven and a half minute miles, and all of a sudden he's producing 165 beats per minute. We know we we need to ease back, and the program needs to adapt immediately because his response is is now a high stress response. And finally, in amongst all that process, we need to consider these external stressors. So again, keeping using Ferguson as an example, but at least it, it, it keeps it tidy. Uh, we, we we need to consider that during that process, he also had commitments to sponsors. He had uh, a lot of travel in there, so. Although we would have liked to have had a fuller week, that would have tipped him over the edge about four, maybe five times if we actually had to ease back. But in easing back and managing those external stresses and considering them to be part of that larger overall stress that we need to manage, we probably yeah, saved, yeah. you know, we, we kept the adaption going forward as opposed to hitting a wall and saying, right, you need to take a week off because now you've, you've trained too hard or whatever. So it's a big, big soup, mate. And, and, but, uh, but all of it intuitive, isn't it? You know, there's nothing... That, that I'm saying to you now that you wouldn't go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And, and hopefully anybody listening would, would, would kind of see the key elements there. The rest of it's just about communication and manipulation of those kind of daily variables. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's a great way of framing it. Um, but firstly, definitely regarding external stresses. Uh, the longer I've been involved with strength and conditioning, the more I've appreciated how much the external stresses actually affect the training program. So almost like that should come first in your head when taking into account or developing it because, you know, people can write a program. Uh, oh, it looks great on paper, but as soon as you try and fit it in around their job, like it just, it's, it's a terrible program because it doesn't work because it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent observation actually, because that's, that's it in a nutshell. And I think, uh, sorry, I got across you, but I know you, you were no, no, go for it. Uh, talking there, but, but I think that that is actually what I think is actually the key to the methodology. So all this intensity, volume manipulation and the metrics and all the rest of it, um, none of it makes any difference if you, unless you actually listen to the athlete, which seems so bloody obvious, doesn't it? But it's not, it's, it's, it's rarely done well. Uh, and I think that, that what sets us apart is we actually, we, we actually do listen and we try to, we try to piece a program around the, the entire individual and their entire environment, which means that, as, as you say, if you've got two people coming to you with the same goal uh, and, and you say, right, well, he, here's how we program for that, it's not going to have success, the same success mm. in both of them because person B might, you know, they might just respond to stress in a different way or, or, or they may have like a, on paper a higher stress job or, or, you know, or, you know, they might just be going through life experiences that mean that, that general day-to-day -day stuff just feels more stressful and you need to be in tune with that. Uh, if not, what you get, and we discuss this with all our clients when they come on, is or we could say to you, and again, just making these numbers up, but we could say to you, right, okay, on a Monday, we want you to do 100 kilos for three reps. And we know from previous testing that that's around your, you know, I don't know, let's call it 80%. So you do three reps and you tell me that that was an RPE 8, right? Fine, that's good. That's where we want you. Perfect. Move on to the next exercise. Now, if we've pre-written that program and we've not considered that actually life happens, we've just said this is how a program should work, this is what the science tells us, then uh, intuitively or naturally, logically perhaps, the following week, 
we're going to program 105 for three, or we're going to program that same 100 kilos for four reps, some kind of progressive overload. But if between that Monday and the following Monday, you know, the, the, the dog chews the postman's leg, you know, the, you have an argument with, you, with your better half, you, the, the job that you have to say is they're going to restructure, you don't know whether you, you, your, your future is safe, et cetera, et cetera. When you get back to that, uh, I'm taking a telephone call there, hold on. When you get back to that squat that following week uh, and, and uh, you, you lift the 100 and the first rep feels like a 10 out of 10, you're going to be really disappointed. Not only is like, why can't I squat? I squat this for three reps last week. But generally an athlete will then try again, you know, or try again and again. So they're, they're risking injury, they're, they're risking backsliding, they're risking overtraining, or not overtraining, but certainly taking themselves to the point where, where recovery is not a premium anymore. Mm. And, and now, you're, now you're two, three weeks back in a program where if you had just been you know, aware of these things or your coach or whoever had been aware of those things and was able to say, all we want is the physiological stress. We don't need, the number doesn't matter on the, on the, on the barbell. What we'll do, Phil, is we'll reduce it to 80 kilos this week, maybe even 75, take a few good warm-up sets, get me you, this week's RPE 8 for three reps. Doesn't matter if it's 75 kilos, doesn't matter if it's 85 kilos, I just want the RPE. So you're just getting the same stress response, you're just getting the same physiological response more or less, and but you're not backsliding, and all that boils down to is simple communication, isn't it? That's nothing to do with, um, you know, <laughs> science, if you like. I mean, it is a, a science in of itself, isn't it? But it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's an art form. Conditioning per se, and it's not forcing a methodology, and and that's. Uh, I think that's key to any kind of training, frankly. But certainly, without that, this kind of hybrid methodology just wouldn't work. I don't think. Yeah, certainly. It definitely sounds like an art form how you've got to take into all account all of these different stresses. And a lot of those yeah. stresses are hard to, to measure, or even sometimes you're not aware of their severity. Um, yeah. When Because you talked about your program from like a very microscopic uh, point of view, so week by week. Uh, and then you've gone on to then talk about how it's very individualized by trying to understand the athlete, understand their stresses, so you can then progress them appropriately. Um, is that the like framework of how you, you regulate? So you're not necessarily writing, okay, here's a 16 week program, um, because you do it week by week. So, okay, here's a framework of a 16 week program. This is roughly what we do. But after each week, we will then reassess, progress how we think is appropriate. Again, reassess uh program how we think is appropriate so then you're say that you know someone signed up to omnia performance and they have like a 16 week program but all of a sudden that 16 week program is completely individualized and different for every client it's appropriate for them yeah. because of how you well because of the philosophy of taking it week by week and auto regulating by trying to understand your client yeah we, we take it even further than that phil we don't okay we don't program for people week by week. We, we do it. Um, the most our program is maybe two, three days. Um, and even then, so, so we, we expect feedback every day from the athlete. We use a, a software suite, which is actually excellent, called Training Peaks. Alex and CHP use the same suite. Okay. Um, and it's really very simple. The, the, the training comes through. If you're the client, the training comes through to you. You do the training and then you leave me notes. So you can leave me the metrics, all these kind of garments and things sync up with it as well. And, and the very specific detail, but we also want your interpretation of oh, this felt good today, this felt bad today. So we have to get to know you and how you interact with training. And so we maybe give you your Monday, Tuesday, uh, and again, going back to that example, let's call that a lower and an upper. Before I put the Wednesday, Thursday in, I want to see your Monday, Tuesday notes so that I know whether or not, you know, if you tell me, going back to that same RPE 8 um, uh, example that I gave, you know, if, if, we, if we look at that and you tell me that the bench press that should have been 100 kilos, you couldn't even get 80 up, then I'm not going to make you do the same threshold run the next day because I know already recovery is is somewhat hampered. So what we probably end up doing is where that threshold run might have been in, we're now going to do a low intensity steady state run. We're going to keep you working, maybe do some zone two stuff. Maybe some of that's maybe psychological so you don't feel like we're just saying take a day off and then people, you know, oh God, am I not even getting get to train now, which is difficult for some folk still get you out there we can still get you on a bike let's say and say well what we want to do today is keep heart rate no higher than 140 but work very specifically on 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 the, the you know the, the the cadence of your pedal work etc you know so we can still do things but what we've done is we use that tuesday and the monday to say okay this now dictates what happens wednesday and thursday and then 
then we have a conversation amongst that about what's going to happen Friday, Saturday. So usually day by day, the most most people will see the advances maybe two, two, three days. But actually going back to what you were saying about having a framework there in place, because this kind of rotating microcycle continues to happen and this the way the concurrent training is set up, they know what's coming. So they know Wednesday is going to be a day they're expected to be out on the bike. They know that Thursday will be a gym day and, and Friday might be some kind of day we do some kind of pre-exhaustion. So they know what to expect on those days. But they, we're not giving them the numbers. Uh, two reasons. One is the one that we're discussing. And number two is that if you then say to somebody, your lift is 100 kilos, and they can't hit that number on the day, they're immediately disappointed in themselves. But if you've only said, today I want you to lift 80, and you rationalize why that is, and they, they hit that, then psychologically they're still progressing as well, which is huge. Because when people fail, naturally, you'll be the same, I'll be the same. You know, you kind of think, well, what have I done wrong? I've done something, you know, why is this? Uh, you know, have I, and, and, and it becomes a very insular kind of you know negative mindset whereas if, if you if you hit the goal that was there for you and you understand that it's changed because of this and the next thing then it's all progress mm. isn't it yeah definitely this sounds all amazing um how can people get in contact with omnia performance if they want to uh, get involved with this programming uh, directly at uh, omniaperformance.com go on there uh, you can book consults uh, with myself or with Fergus through through the mm. site um, they can find me uh, oh, there's the Omnia Performance at Omnia Performance Instagram page uh, and again you're just directly messaging either myself or Fergus through that um, and then there's our emails there which is omnia-performance uh, and our, our first names before that so Jonathan at omnia-performance.com and then we both have our own um, Instagram pages so I'm at Jonathan Payne Fergus is at Fergus Crawley um, you'll find a lot more of the information it tends to be through Fergus's channel actually because he's uh, he's developed that little YouTube um, sort of big YouTube mm. following now and, and so we, we, we use that as a conduit to get, get the information out there and uh, I'll sit in the background look at a marionette and see if I can <laughs> move things about but uh, yeah we're, we're relatively easy to find and uh, it's just the usual places and, and very very yeah. easy to reach out. i definitely i'll put all of that in the show notes including youtube channels and everything so i definitely recommend everyone Great, who's everyone. listening just to check all that out mm -hmm. and if you want to try and take on a challenge that's just that little bit different and wants to you know be strong and be very cardiovascularly fit as well like just go for it and see what see what you can do and also see what you can learn um I'd love to finish off, Johnny, in knowing which of your challenges that you've done recently, maybe we'll go with Fergus, which one's been your favourite and why? Yeah, that's an interesting. I mean, these things change, don't they? That, that's an interesting one. I've, 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 uh, I think because it's more, it's fresh in our minds and it, it was very, very tough, Project Vertical, um, it, it stands out. Uh, it's relatively mm. unique as well. For, for anybody who doesn't know what Project Vertical was, we... We attempted to um, to scale Ben Nevis uh, up here in Scotland enough times over and over to accumulate a vertical marathon in, in terms of uh, vertical gains. So it's, uh, it, it would have been 30, I think 32, 33 times we had to, to consecutively climb Nevis. Uh, but we only had a window of 11 days to do that because of the, the, the support network that we had. And, and really just taking time away off work, et cetera, et cetera. So over the 11 days, uh, we, we underestimated the mountain, frankly. And, and over those 11 days, we, um, I think I got 22 times up the mountain. Uh, Fergus, Fergus won less because he, he came up with a bit of an injury on the very last, or, or his injuries caught up with him on the very last day. So that was, that was a, 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 an undertaking and a half. But actually, the things that we got from that, there's, there's a documentary. If you follow the, follow the, the um, maybe you yeah, show this as well, Phil, but the, uh, the documentary itself um, details a lot of why we did it. We did it to, to draw attention to men's mental health. We felt like we did that well. Uh, it certainly gained enough traction to, to uh, cause the right effect. Um, but uh, as far as us as individuals went, um, the, the mental uh, task was much bigger than the physical task, which sounds ridiculous when you say you're going to, climb the highest mountain in the UK 22 times in a row, but it became a lot about mindset. So any challenge that I've done, that's, that eventually it's about whether you can dig deep enough mentally uh, have always been the ones that I'm, that I'm drawn to. Um, <laughs> and that was certainly a way to expose any inner demons yeah. that, that one might have. And uh, huh. we're still here. So it was, it was, it was fun. It certainly, it certainly was fun. It was, it was hard, uh, but I came away smiling. So that's, that's a bonus. Yeah, what about it was so mentally draining and mentally difficult? 
Is it just the repetition of, oh, you know, each summit and descent, what, take four to five hours? Sorry, it's been a while since I've done Ben Nevis. And then you've got to just repeat that over and over again. Is it just the slog and... What I'm trying to guess is I reckon people will see that and think, well, you you, you know, you can just go slowly. You're walking up and down mountains. How hard can it be? But really, it's really difficult. Um, and I just want the listener to really appreciate just how tough it is. Well, to give you an example, um, the by day three, so I, I have a, um, we were going to talk about skiing, maybe we ran out of time to talk about skateboarding, but uh, in 1999 skateboarding, I, 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 I broke my knee really very, oh, wow. very badly. I was in a wheelchair for a while, I had, uh, you know, all kinds of screws holding me together and things. A tough time. So my knee's been reconstructed three or four times. And, and um, I knew that it was going to be physically tough for me to do something so repetitively over and over. And, and, and when, when one thinks about the descents, you know, you, you're constant eccentric force and, and slowing yourself down as you come down the mountain. It takes it t- takes its toll. Anybody, you, know, you can climb very very big mountains, but you're not going to be doing it over and over and over for, for you know for that amount of time in that kind of terrain either. Um, so by day three, uh, my worst I think day three or day four, my worst nightmare had come true, and, and, and I tore in both knees. Um, so it's only afterwards we found out I went to see some professionals and had uh, grade three tears r- wow. right through both knees, pretty, pretty bad. Um, yeah, and I was, I was in, a, in a great deal of pain uh, by, by day three, day four. And my concern was that then I was going to derail the project, that me being slow meant that Fergus would feel compelled to slow down. And we, we, we talked about what would happen if one of us got injured. But then the reality is you still want to kind of care for the other person because we were very much in that together, even after after mm. day two. It was only us that was going through it, you know. So so I was very concerned that that was going to be a big uh, problem and, and um, ultimately pushed through uh, and, and got through that kind of, barrier of pain I, I just had to accept the pain frankly it never went away it was i was in a lot of pain the whole time but um i, I think that 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 kind of finding a way to cope with the pain daily was was really a huge mental struggle because every part of you said well just stop you know uh, but we felt like we committed to, to pushing until we had to stop and i knew that there was still more in me so that that made it tough uh, and, and as you said actually one of the toughest parts was just the repetition, you know, getting up in the morning. We had to get up at three o'clock or so in the morning each day to get ourselves fed, get back to the mountain and just start again. And just, you know, it's a Sisyphal tale, isn't it? I talked about Sisyphus quite a few mm-hmm. times where you're just pushing that boulder up to the top and then right start again. And it felt like an eternity. So we became that kind of, we became Sisyphus for that, for that amount of time. So it became quite, quite torturous just to do the same things over and over. Um, so what we had to do then was kind of find ways of making it different each day. And, mm-hmm. and, and obviously we, we can't make the mountain different, but the view was different. The weather was different. People came and joined us for certain climbs. Sometimes we talked, sometimes we didn't. So, you know, we, we got through it, but uh, it was dark at times. It was, it was difficult, um, but but ultimately rewarding because uh, we met that. I, I often say with these things that you'll meet yourself on these journeys, you know, and, and hopefully – when I've done some, some very extreme ultra marathons and things as well. Each time I've expected to have these questions asked of myself, I've expected to come up against this kind of quote unquote weak version, this kind of shadow version of Johnny who says, just give up, you know, pack it in. You can go, nobody will even know, you know, you can go home and say a lie and bit you or something, just make some shit up. Nobody will ever, you know, because nobody would know you. And, and most people wouldn't even judge you or not, not care much, frankly, nobody really cares. But the, uh, the, uh, the reality of it is you'll meet those questions and, and I'm always keen to find out, you know, how I answer that kind of uh, <clears throat> devil on my shoulder. And, and so far I've, I've always come up, uh, come up quite pretty strong, but it's an interesting place to find yourself. And it's a place that not many people are keen to put themselves, but you know, with, with, within the boundaries of safety, so that I'm not kind of that COA moment here. I don't want to encourage people to go out and claim Nevis 22 times in a row to see how they feel. But I certainly think that people should challenge themselves beyond what they currently can do in whatever way that they can that they can seek out uh, and see what those questions are and, and see what the answers are and, and th- there's much mm. learning there's much learning and suffering uh, stra- a strange way if, if we're ending <laughs> now that's a very strange no, I'm, morbid note to end on but uh, the, the, the gift of suffering is, is pretty huge I think yeah I, I think it's a great message that you seem to learn the most about yourself during times of real intense stress and what I've always found almost quite weird is that 
you learn a lot of stuff about learn a lot of, about yourself during these times uh and you see how that's applied in your new world like post it and then you look back on that stress like you're like, oh, i wouldn't do it again but you look back on it with a certain level of fondness because you appreciate just how much you learned about yourself uh during it yeah. and it it just it's, it seems a bit weird well i wouldn't do it again i hated it but i'm really glad that i did it but <laughs> but probably would <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. In fact, we've got something coming up now, uh, uh, maybe a little plug for, but some, something that, that you, your listeners um, would probably be interested in. I think yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Is, um, we have uh, a, a great relationship with the fellas at uh, Through Dark um, Clothing Company, both uh, Staz and Louie are, are ex-Special Forces chaps, and, and they've um, Okay, yeah, Staz was on SAS, wasn't he? That's right. He was on the uh, who, who did SES Who Day of Wins as the as the mole recently. Um, yeah. So they're good friends of of ours. And um, Louis's brother um, Frankie is actually starting to uh, on Saturday, I believe. He he starts uh, talisman triathlon. So if you people can go online and look at through through dark, actually through me, I'll be sharing it as well, uh, or directly at talisman triathlon. And Frankie is going from the from Lands End. Uh, a kind of an ingress from there to Lake Bala, I believe it's called it in, in Wales. So, so from so on the bike and running, he's going to go there and, and through through the through um, England, Scotland, and Wales. He's going to on bike and foot uh, travel the length of the country, but stopping to swim the largest lakes in each country and climb the highest mountains. So essentially, it's, a, huh. or, it, it's, it's an extreme triathlon in a very in a very real sense, rather than the one we described earlier on, which is kind of a a magnified triathlon. This is just sort of an extreme way of piecing together those uh, things. Uh, he's doing it in order to draw attention again to men's mental health through through CAM. Uh, um, oh yeah, I know CAM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Campaign for, against living miserably, uh, and to raise awareness and, and and to sort of bring people together on in, in that front. But going back to to the suffering, I mean, I'll be supporting um, Frankie on the Scottish legs, so he'll get here and. Uh, Fergus is going to do a bit of the swim with them, I believe, and, and I'll be up at Nevis again. God damn it. <laughs> we will be <laughs> running through. Oh, not again, not God. again. I uh, know, I know. Exactly. PTSD twitches and mm. things. But we're going, to, yeah. we're going to try and do that uh, and then follow him up uh, as far as John Groves um, uh, and hopefully see. But something like that, you know, the undertaking of something like that, the, the, the nerves that he must be going through, now, he's carrying it brilliantly. Uh, a, a marine uh, and, a, and, a, and a PTI in the marine, so so again, no stress. But certainly, mm. this is new, uh, and, and something like that you look at. The reason I'm bringing this up, apart from the fact that it's epic, uh, and, and hopefully people can go and look at that and, and maybe follow on and support, is that it comes down to that same kind of uh, thing. You know, uh, Stas asked him earlier on in an interview why he, uh, you know, what he'd done to prepare for it, and he's only been preparing for things like that all his life he's he's always been fit always been strong always been ready and and he's just had to focus more on those modalities recently but ultimately there is no preparation for starting something like that you know it's going to be huge and monumental uh, and you're gonna to have to draw on certain motivational things for externally but actually the reality is you just got to take each moment as it comes and meet those sort of moments of darkness either on your own in your own head or draw on the support around you and those are great metaphors, uh, and, and Frankie's very much encapsulating that for what we probably should do for, for, for mental health, which is to sometimes try and work up the resilience and work up the, the, the mental courage to deal with these things ourselves, actually to face things head on and recognise them for what they are, but also to be aware of uh, and ready to, without ego, draw on those support networks around you. Uh, and, and that's very much where all the kind of campaigns and things that we've done and certainly my own athletic background has been about is, is, is that ability to, 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 to be resourceful and, and to, to find something in yourself to continue, but also to know that you, no man is a rock, no man is an island or, or woman. Uh, and these, these campaigns and these kind of extreme things allow people to explore themselves, but they're also excellent for allowing other people to kind of look in and see something in the in, a, in it up for themselves as well so hopefully we can through that campaign frankie through dark and, and externally the likes of myself supporting it can draw eyes in and uh, people can either think i want to do something extreme and really really challenge myself maybe that's what the message that they get or maybe they get a message of of, of continuing to look after their own mental health or help others around so 
these things, although they might seem arbitrary, end up being kind of vehicles for, for great good, I think. Yeah. What, a, what a, an amazing challenge for an amazing cause. I think it'll be made. I will put everything I can for that challenge and that cause on our show notes and I'll do what I can to share it through Instagram as well. I think that's brilliant. Um, I'd be grateful. I'd love that. I think it's a great message to end on because more and more people are taking on these types of challenges and they're, it's allowing them to ask themselves questions and it's bringing awareness to them to show them what they can actually achieve. And it's really helping their mental resilience, which I think is which is brilliant. So the more and more that sort of like all these different like through dark Omnia progress theory, <laughs> we're all collaborating because we all have similar goals in yeah. a way. We can work together to really, yeah, so, yeah. really sort of advertise these cause and uh, hopefully, you know, help a lot of people with their mental health. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's great to see. I agree with you entirely. It's, it's great to see it. But we, you can help one person. You know, it's, we've said it with any of our campaigns, and we know we've got a lot of personal feedback. Where, uh, after uh, the Nevis campaign where people were, were, were directly saying, you know, there was something in what you were doing, not even sure what it was, something intangible for, for, for whoever that person was that made them stop and think, yeah, maybe there's a different way to look at what I'm doing. You know, maybe we, we our catch-all, our, our sort of dragging our hashtag, if you like, was claim your own mountain, mm-hmm. you know, and, and uh, you know, with these things, if you can signpost it, I can signpost it, we can, we can attract some attention to it, you know, and if we help one person to, to kind of... Uh, make a more positive choice uh, in, in moments of high stress than, than it's every moment that, that Frankie puts under his feet um, will be worth it, I think. And, and us, if we, if, we, if we push for another campaign uh, like that, uh, it, it makes it worthwhile. And there, there's another motivation to keep moving is because uh, you want to do some good, some, some kind of service to others, which I think is a very human yeah, trait. Definitely. All right, this has been absolutely brilliant. Johnny, I feel like we might need a round two somewhere down the line to talk more about training because I think there's going to be more challenges um, and all sorts of things that we can discuss. So thank you for such a brilliant episode. And we never even got to the skateboarding. I know. So we might have to have a separate episode just <laughs> for skateboarding, especially post-Olympics. Maybe that. Yeah, maybe that. I'll, I'll... <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Well, brilliant. <laughs> thank you very much. And everyone, check out Johnny's Omnia performance and his Instagrams, which he mentioned earlier in the show. Johnny, cheers. I will hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much, Phil. Thanks.